Hello and good day to wherever you are listening to us today. It's Monday, 26 April 2021. My name is Christian Lindmeier and I'm welcoming you to today's global COVID-19 press conference with a special focus on the impact of COVID-19 on immunization as we mark World Immunization Week, which started on Saturday, 24 April. Uh, the press conference will include two special guests today, and that is Henrietta Four, UNICEF Executive Director, and Dr. Seth Berkeley, C CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Welcome. Simultaneous interpretation is provided in the six official languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian, plus Portuguese and Hindi. Present in the room are Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General, Dr. Maria van Kerkhove, Technical Lead on COVID-19, Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director for Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals, and Dr. Anne Lindstrand, the Head of the Essential Immunization Program of WHO. We have other colleagues online, if necessary. With this, let me hand over immediately to Dr. Tedros for the opening remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Globally, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to intensify. Cases have now increased for the ninth straight week, and deaths have increased for the sixth straight week. To put it in perspective, there were almost as many cases globally last week as in the first five months of the pandemic. It's pleasing to see small declines in cases and deaths in several regions, but many countries are still experiencing intense transmission, and the situation in India is beyond heartbreaking. WHO is doing everything we can providing critical equipment and supplies, including thousands of oxygen concentrators, prefabricated mobile field hospitals, and laboratory supplies. As I mentioned on Friday, WHO has redeployed more than 2,600 staff to support the response on the ground, providing support for surveillance, technical advice, and vaccination efforts. Never before has the value of vaccination been so apparent. Today marks the start of World Immunization Week at a time when the world's attention is focused on vaccines like never before. With the theme, Vaccines Bring Us Closer, World Immunization Week shows how vaccination connects us to the people goals and moments that matter most, helping improve the health of everyone, everywhere throughout life. Vaccines are one of the most powerful and transformative in inventions in history. Thanks to vaccines, smallpox is now in the history books. Polio has been pushed to the brink of eradication and once feared diseases like diphtheria, tetanus and meningitis are now easily prevented. And new vaccines continue to push back the frontiers of disease. In the past 15 years, new vaccines have been approved to prevent cervical cancer, malaria, and Ebola. And now, safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines have been developed in record time, bringing us closer to ending the pandemic. On Wednesday, the WHO Foundation is launching a new global fundraising campaign called Go Give One to give everyone a chance to play their part in helping to vaccinate the world. Go Give One is aiming to engage 50 million people to contribute and is open to everyone, individuals and organizations of all sizes. The money raised will go to COVAX to buy vaccines for the world, starting with those who need them the most. More information will follow this week. 
But even as COVID-19 vaccines give us hope of light at the end of the tunnel, the pandemic has caused several disruptions to immunization services around the world. New WHO data shows that as a result of COVID-19, 60 immunization campaigns are currently suspended in 50 countries. That means about 228 million children are vulnerable right now to deadly vaccine preventable diseases such as measles, yellow fever, and polio. Measles campaigns are the most affected, accounting for 23 of the postponed campaigns. Many measles campaigns have now been delayed for more than a year. In addition to targeted campaigns to prevent or respond to outbreaks, routine childhood immunization services also continue to be disrupted by COVID-19. The latest WHO Pulse survey shows that routine immunization services were disrupted in more than a third of countries in the first quarter of 2021. While this represents a significant improvement over last year, it remains a serious concern. Gaps in vaccination coverage are already having grave real-world consequences. Serious measles outbreaks have occurred in several countries, including the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Pakistan, and Yemen. And the risk of measles outbreaks is mounting elsewhere as more and more children miss out on the vaccines they so urgently need. So we must turn the tide quickly and rebound from these disruptions. WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and other partners are working with countries to ensure that immunization services are restored quickly and safely. But we must not forget that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, nearly 20 million children missed out on life-saving vaccines each year. So we must not only get immunization back on track, but do better than before. Today, we're launching a bold new plan to do just that. The Immunization Agenda 2030 is an ambitious new global strategy to maximize the life-saving impact of vaccines over the next decade. Our aim is to maintain hard-won gains in immunization, avoid backsliding, and achieve even more by leaving no one behind in any situation or at any stage of life. If fully implemented, the Immunization Agenda 2030 could avert over 50 million deaths over the next decade. 75% of them in low- and middle-income countries. To achieve these goals, all of us must step up and take action. First, we call on world leaders and the global health and development community to make bold new commitments to advance this strategy. Second, we call on all countries to develop and implement national plans that align with the Immunization Agenda 2030 and increase investments to make immunization accessible to all. Third, we call on donors and governments to increase investments in vaccine research, development, and delivery focused on the needs of underserved populations. And fourth, we call on the vaccine industry and scientists to continue to accelerate research and development ensure a continuous supply of affordable vaccines to meet global needs and apply lessons from COVID-19 to other diseases. Together, we can make up lost ground in immunization, support the global recovery from COVID-19, and make sure no one misses out on the life-saving power of vaccines. The Immunization Agenda 2030 has been developed by WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and many other partners. And it's now my honor to introduce my sister, Henrietta Ford, the executive director of UNICEF. Henrietta, thank you, as always, for your leadership. 
and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Tedros. Um, uh, it is also very nice to see Dr. Berkeley here this morning uh, for, uh, for us. Um, this week is indeed World Immunization Week, but effectively this year has become World Immunization Year. Because after a year of lockdowns and empty classrooms, missed vaccinations and virtual birthday parties, canceled family dinners, people all over the world are now anticipating vaccines within their community. Those of us in the global development understand how much and how important vaccines are. But this year, every single person on the planet knows it and we all want reunions with our families. This year, more than any other, has reminded us that vaccines bring us together. But while COVID-19 vaccines represent our best hope of returning to normal lives, we need to remind ourselves that millions of children all over the world have no access to vaccines for any of the preventable diseases whatsoever. This is not a normal that we should return to. As Tedros has mentioned, even before the pandemic, we were losing ground in the fight against preventable child illness. 20 million children were already missing out on critical vaccinations. And I will place measles and polio at the top of my list. And now a year into the COVID-19 pandemic, we are still making up lost ground. While there has been progress from the peak of the global lockdowns, routine immunization services remained disruptive in 37% of responding countries in the first quarter of 2021. Disruptions as a result of COVID-19 have made this problem even worse. In 2020, UNICEF, the largest global procurer and supplier of vaccines, delivered 2.01 billion vaccine doses, down from 2.29 billion doses the previous year. Considering the unprecedented global lockdown, Sorry for losing the contact right now. Uh, the image is frozen. We'll try for a second to reconnect. If we don't manage, then I would possibly ask to move to the next guest. Mm. Maybe a minute or two. Your connection. Move on. lost the line. Unfortunately, we lost the line to Henrietta IV. Um, yeah. Yourself. So we, I think we can uh, move. Still no? Yeah. Okay. Henrietta, My I think apologies. you're back. Sorry, <laughs> I just dropped. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I believe that you lost me when I was talking about our vaccine dose procurements. Would that sound right? Yes, indeed. All right. So um, in 2020, UNICEF was the largest global procurer and supplier of vaccines. We delivered 2.01 billion vaccine doses, down from 2.29 billion doses the previous year. Considering the unprecedented global lockdowns and their impact on supply delivery, this was a remarkable achievement. UNICEF also managed to deliver 912.7 million syringes for immunization and 10 million safety boxes to 83 countries. And we installed 18,340 cold fridges in health facilities in 25 countries another remarkable 
achievement. Over the past few months, we have repeatedly expressed our deep concern with the inequitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. WHO and Dr. Tedros have said last week that of the over 890 million COVID-19 vaccine doses that have been administered globally, more than 81% have been given in high and upper middle income countries. This is not only unfair, but it is also unwise because a threat anywhere is a threat everywhere, especially with a worrying rise in variants. But for the people living in the countries where 20 million children are already missing out on life-saving vaccines, it is also unsurprising. Vaccines have always been inequitably distributed but now is the time to change this. We can use this unique moment in time to spur long-term momentum towards finally achieving universal access to routine immunizations and broader primary health care. And that is why I am so pleased to join with my fellow panelists in launching Immunization Agenda 2030, a comprehensive plan to maximize the impact of vaccination over the next decade. IA2030 is an ambitious global strategy to maximize the impact of vaccines. We are aiming to save an estimated 50 million lives, to have the number of children receiving zero vaccine doses, and to achieve 90% coverage for key vaccines over the next decade. As a part of our engagement in IA2030 and World Immunization Week, UNICEF is calling on governments to prioritize strengthening of health systems in the poorest countries. We need to increase global domestic investment to continue delivering vaccinations and other critical services for the most vulnerable children and to guarantee universal, accessible and quality care for the long run. We call on governments to protect aid budgets and to fulfill existing commitments which support life-saving child health services, including routine immunization, nutrition, and maternal health. And donors should also increase investments in vaccine research and innovation, development, and delivery, focusing on the needs of the underserved. The pharmaceutical industry and scientists working with governments and funders should continue to accelerate vaccine research and development, ensure a continuous supply of affordable vaccines to meet the global needs and apply the lessons from COVID-19 to other diseases. Finally, we need to take steps to make sure that parents and caregivers trust health workers and heed their advice on vaccinating their children against preventable diseases. Later this week, UNICEF will be joining the Yale Institute for Global Health and Public Goods Projects to announce a new initiative to equip country teams with tools to counter misinformation and mistrust, all related to vaccines. We will be sure to make these details available soon. The stage is set for 2021 to be a pivotal year for immunization. Through COVAX and other global efforts to make the COVID-19 vaccines available for all, we are embarking on an unprecedented global immunization campaign. But this campaign cannot come at the cost of childhood vaccinations. We cannot trade one global health crisis for another. In a year when vaccines are at the forefront of everyone's minds, we must sustain this energy to accelerate efforts on all three fronts, providing equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, catching up on missed vaccinations due to the pandemic lockdown, and critically extending immunization efforts to all children currently missing out on vaccines entirely. We have no time to waste Lost ground means lost lives. Join our calls. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Henrietta. For more than 20 years, 
Gavi has played a vital role in realizing the power of vaccines for the world's most vulnerable communities. It's now my pleasure to welcome Gavi's Chief Executive Officer, my brother, Seth Berkeley. Seth, thank you so much, as always, for your partnership and leadership. You have the floor. Thank you, Tedros and Henrietta. Um, as we mark World Immunization Week, I'm very proud to stand together with our longstanding alliance partners, WHO and UNICEF, to launch Immunization Agenda 2030. Immunization is the most widely distributed health intervention. And in the last 21 years, the Alliance has worked together to successfully increase coverage and introduce more than 500 new vaccines, which has led to reduce vaccine preventable diseases by 70%. But despite these successes, you've heard about the 20 million children that are under immunized every year. I would like to talk about a subset of these, the nearly 10 million children in lower income countries that don't receive a single shot, um, leaving them vulnerable to some of the world's most deadly diseases. Now, of course, you've already heard that due to the pandemic, more children across the world are likely to miss out on basic vaccines, threatening to unravel the two decades of progress. So what we need to support the recovery from COVID-19 is, and, and to fight future pandemic is to make sure that we um, uh, um, prioritize routine immunization. We must specifically focus on improving the situation for children and their families who do not receive any routine vaccines, so-called zero dose children. These children usually live in communities that suffer not just from high child mortality, but also deep-rooted social issues and gender disparities, including high maternal death. Zero-dose children are also less likely to live in a household with access to safe water and sanitation. That is why we need a global movement to reach these missed communities. We need to work together across development agencies, governments, and civil society. If we can reach them with immunization, we can also bring the other services every child needs to live a healthy, successful life from education to clean water and sanitation. Reaching zero dose children could also improve global health security. This contact with the health systems allows health professionals to systematically be on the lookout for new outbreaks and new emerging diseases. This early warning system is one of our first lines of defense against the next pandemic as we battle the current crisis. As of today, in collaboration with our partners, WHO, CEPI, and UNICEF through COVAX, a multilateral mechanism which aims to secure equitable vaccines um, for COVID, we've been able to provide over 45 million doses of the vaccine to 120 economies across the world. These doses are being used to protect healthcare workers, the elderly, and other high-risk groups, and in turn, those who are closest to them. But as you've heard, we're not where we need to be on equity, and this also needs intense focus. COVAX has been a worldwide effort, and the support of governments and partners has been critical. And similarly, with the launch of the Immunization Agenda 2030, we need the support of leaders and others to ensure that no child is left behind. One key target of the IA 2030 strategy is to reduce the number of zero-dose children by 50% by 2030. This will be a core focus for us at Gavi. The cost of inaction is clear. Communities with large numbers of under-immunized children are more vulnerable to disease outbreaks. Outbreaks push the community further into poverty as household health expenditures rise, impact a child's right to survival and development, divert resources from already stretched health systems, and pose significant risks to global health security. Through partnerships and collaboration, we can leverage all of our strengths to reach communities and ensure they have the tools they need to build a successful life 
from education to clean water to life-saving vaccines, and also have the systems to deliver epidemic vaccines like yellow fever, cholera, meningitis, measles, even Ebola. As you've also heard, it's critical that we continue on the pathway of making sure that the research and development for new vaccines and new technologies continues to bring us better, easier to use, and, and heat-stable vaccine. So as we embark on this next phase of routine immunization, we must recommit to fully immunizing every child on Earth and rapidly make up for the ground we've lost to COVID-19 that Tedros has already talked about. This is not only a Gavi priority, it's closely aligned with the core mission of the Sustainable Development Goals to leave no one behind. Let's have vaccines bring us closer together. Let's all do our part to make this a reality. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, for including me. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Now for a few words about the specifics of the Immunization Agenda 2030, I would like to turn to my colleague, Kate O'Brien, WHO's Director of Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals. Kate, you have the floor. Thank you so much. You've heard that Immunization Agenda 2030 is this ambitious global strategy to maximize the life-saving impact of vaccines in this new era that we're all in. It's really being launched at a critical time during World Immunization Week when all eyes are on vaccines and immunization programs, those programs that actually deliver those vaccines to people of all ages in every corner of the world. And you've heard about some of the numbers about what achieving the agenda in this new decade would actually mean. It would mean reducing by half the children who are completely left out of essential vaccines the zero-dose children. It would, mean, it would mean achieving another 500 introductions of new and underused vaccines in low- and middle-income countries. It would also mean achieving 90% coverage of the key life-saving vaccines. And if those goals are achieved, the latest estimates show that the strategy would avert over 50 million deaths that would otherwise occur among children and adolescents by 2030. So this is a global strategy. It's created by and for the global community and requires broad ownership by all immunization and non-immunization stakeholders. It's designed to respond to every country in the world, regardless of income level or geography. And it's not owned or the sole responsibility of any one country or any one agency. The IA2030 strategy puts people at the center. It's led by countries implemented through broad partnerships and driven by high quality data. It positions immunization as a key component of primary health care to help achieve universal coverage and the sustainable development goals as Seth just mentioned. It serves as an umbrella for all issues related to vaccines and immunization, guiding countries and regions to develop their operational frameworks to make it real. Unlike many global plans, IA2030 was co-created through a collaborative bottom-up process that engaged thousands of stakeholders around the world. And it also draws deeply on the lessons that have been learned from this past decade of immunization and addresses emerging challenges such as COVID-19, demographic shifts, and urbanization. And moving forward, it will continue to champion a collaborative, community-owned, country-participatory partnership approach to immunization. The goals are designed to inspire action at the local, national, regional, and global levels. A framework for acting, for action, has been developed to ensure we translate that vision that we've laid out into collective action across all of those layers of countries and regions, civil society, and development partners. And it's an adaptive and flexible strategy so it will be tailored by every country to their needs and situation and revised as new opportunities and challenges emerge. This is a collective strategy and a collective call to action to maintain the hard-won gains in immunization, recover from the disruption caused by COVID-19, increase equitable access to vaccines for everyone. And it will require a commitment from leaders, investment, 
and political will to ensure everyone at all ages in all countries benefits from the life-saving impact of vaccines and brings us all closer to a better and more equitable future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And thanks again to Henrietta and Seth for joining us today. Vaccines are a triumph of science. Science has always been at the heart of WHO's work. And never has science been so critical in addressing global health challenges as it is now. As part of WHO's transformation, we established a new science division two years ago, appointed WHO's first chief scientist. And last year, we decided to establish a WHO Science Council to provide advice on high priority scientific issues that could have a direct impact on global health. The Science Council has now been established, comprising nine leading scientists from around the world and will be chaired by Professor Harold Varmus, the winner of the 1918 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. The Council will hold its first meeting tomorrow, where it will decide on initial steps and program of work. And I would like to thank all the members of the Council for, for joining. Thank you so much. Christian, back to you. Thank you so much. And let me now open the floor to questions from the media. Um, to get into the queue to ask questions, you need to raise your hand using the raise your hand icon. And then do not forget to unmute yourself. And we'll start on my list with Paulina Alcazar from Encadena News. Paulina, please unmute yourself. Gracias, Christian. ¿Me escuchan? Yes, we hear you. Gracias. Eh, nuestra pregunta en esta ocasión, eh, les comento, se está llevando a cabo la Cumbre Mundial de Turismo en Cancún uniendo al mundo en la recuperación, donde implementaron burbujas sanitarias y la agenda se trata sobre, sobre el impacto hacia la recuperación en COVID, la reconstrucción de viajes y los viajes del futuro. ¿Qué mensaje, doctor Tedros, podría enviarles a esta importante cumbre que se está organizando? Thank you very much, Paulina. And I'll ask Dr. Van Kerkhove, please. Yes, thanks. I'll start, and I'm sure others will want to come in because this is such an important topic. So as the world is recovering um, from the pandemic, I should, you know, I, I would, it would behoove me to, to not say that we're still in the acute phase of this pandemic. And the trajectory that we are seeing globally is incredibly worrying, with the ninth straight week of increasing incidents around the world. Um, clearly, it's not being driven um, at the same level of intensity around the world, and we're all looking about how we open up, reopen up societies. Um, these need to be done in a staged way, in a staged approach, where first and foremost, we get control over this virus. Um, and there are many ways in which we can take back control over the SARS-CoV-2 virus through a combination of public health measures at individual level measure, levels, at community levels, at subnational levels, national levels, international levels. There are medical interventions, vaccines and vaccinations um, that are coming online. But as you've heard us say over and over again, there is an uneven and inequitable distribution of the SARS, COVID, the COVID-19 vaccine so far. We are seeing improvements in that, but still there is an inequitable distribution of that. But as we um, gain control over this virus, um, there are ways in which um, societies can open up. This also includes travel. But it's about how an individual leaves their home through all of the different stages of travel and looking at, first and foremost, does that travel need to happen right now? Um, and in many parts of the world, that answer is no. In some parts of the world where there are these travel bubbles that are established, um, where some countries have brought the virus under control, they have very low levels of transmission or no transmission, they have opened up these corridors, and they have taken a risk-based approach into opening up and into having the right characteristics for travel um, and keeping the passenger safe from leaving their home all the way through. Um, we are working with our partners um, in the travel industry um, across many of the different hospitality industries as well to ensure that when this does open up, it can open up as safely as possible. Right now, there's no zero risk, and so it's about measuring that risk 
um, and trying to minimize the risk through the whole part of the travel uh, experience. Others may want to come in. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. I'm looking around and not on, then we'll move to the next question, and that's Shoko Koyama from Japanese TV NHK. Shoko, please unmute yourself. Hello, Christian. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. My question is about the status of COVID-19 vaccines within WHO emergency use listing evaluation procedure. So two Chinese candidates, uh, according to the latest guidance document, the um, anticipated decision dates are end April for Sinopharm and early May for Sinovac, if, if I'm correct. Um, so when exactly are these candidates going to be assessed, and when does the WHO make a decision whether to register these vaccines to the emergency use listing? Thank you. Thank you so much, Shoko, and we should have Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products, online with us. Dr. Simao, please. Good morning, and thank you. Thank you for the question, Shoko. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, you can. Uh, we, we do have a technical advisory group, an expert group meeting met today and will meet the next days to assess Sinopharm. We are meeting on Friday to assess Moderna and next week on the 5th of May we will be assessing Sinovac. So we expect that Sinopharm we will have a decision before the end of this week and Sinovac most likely by the end of next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Simao. Next question goes to Nina Larson from AFP. Nina, please unmute yourself. Yes, hi. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I want to ask about uh, India, which is um, temporarily frozen exports of the AstraZeneca vaccine from the Serum Institute uh, to help address the vaccine needs there. I understand that COVAX was therefore 90 million doses short uh, in March and April. Um, and I know you've asked for donations from countries uh, with excess doses to help compensate for that. So I was wondering how many have you received so far, if any, and how confident are you that the Indian government will release vaccine doses to COVAX in May? Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. And we'll look at uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley from the Gavida Vaccine Alliance, possibly. Yes, thank you for that uh, question. So um, we are in early days on discussions on, on dose sharing. Um, um, we had an announcement last Friday from Pe President Macron that he would be sharing up to a half a million doses. And we've also had an announcement from um, New Zealand that they would be sharing 1.6 million doses. And we've heard from the Spanish prime minister that they would be sharing doses. So we're beginning to see engagement from uh, many on uh, dose sharing, which is an important priority given the fact that um, countries have purchased uh, large uh, portfolios of vaccines not knowing which would work and therefore ultimately will have more doses than they need for their populations. Your numbers are correct. We had expected 90 million doses for uh, March and April um, uh, for uh, the 60 lowest income countries, including India, and those have not um, been made available given the crisis in India now. They're being used domestically, and we are, are waiting um, when uh, supplies will resume. We're looking at other options at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Berkeley. Next question goes to Jenny Leavello from DevEx. Jenny. No, she seems to have dropped. Okay. Uh, then we move on to Simon Ateba from Today News Africa. Simon, please unmute yourself. Thank you for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. India was initially seen as a success story for its response to COVID-19. Now thousands of people are dying in India every day. Hundreds of thousands of new infections are being recorded every day. All ventilators are in use and intensive care units are operating at full capacity. The healthcare system is on the brink of collapse. 
the same situation is happening in Africa. Africa has been seen, was seen has initially has a success story with fewer cases and fewer deaths. How worried are you that what we are seeing in India right now may likely happen in Africa? And when can we expect most people in Africa to be fully vaccinated? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Dr. Maria van Kerkhoek. Yes, so I'll, I'll start with the first part of that question. So Simon, as you've pointed out, the situation in India is really um, heartbreaking, as the Director General has said, and, the, and the, the exponential growth that we've seen in case numbers is really, truly astonishing. Um, we have seen similar trajectories of increases in transmission in a number of countries. It has not been at the same scale and it has not had the same level of impact and burden on the healthcare system that we've seen in India, but we have seen similar trajectories where the incidence was almost vertical if you looked at that epi curve. Um, this can happen um, in a number of countries, in any countries, if we let our guard down. I'm not saying that India has let its guard down, but I'm saying we're in a fragile situation. Nine weeks of case incidents increasing, more than fi almost 5.7 million cases reported last week, and that is certainly an underestimate of the true number of cases of infections that have occurred in the last week. Um, it's a fragile situation globally, um, and we really have the elements around the world um, with you know, a, a lack of, of strategic and comprehensive use of public health and social measures for a variety of reasons, some of which because some individuals cannot attain physical distancing, living in very crowded situations, cannot wear proper use of masks because they don't have those masks or they don't have three-layer fabric masks or for a number of reasons or social gatherings taking place. We still need to apply all of these elements of physical distancing as much as we can. Mass, avoiding of mass gatherings, avoiding of crowded spaces, improving ventilation in indoor, indoor settings, spending as much time as we can outdoors compared to indoors, um, and using vaccines um, as much as we can for frontline workers and those who are most at risk. So the situation is fragile. The situation can grow um, if we allow it to. And this is why it's important that every single person on the planet knows that they have a role to play. And we need governments to be able to support them in taking the actions that will inform them about what they need to do and keep them safe and make sure that they can actually carry out uh, the measures that are being asked of them in the local situation where they are. So I think uh, you present a, a situation across India, but also in Africa, as you mentioned. Um, we do need to not let our guard down and really follow through on all of these measures that we can and make sure that governments continue to apply comprehensive approaches, informing, engaging, enabling populations so that they know what they need to do to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, please. Just the second part of the question, which was about, you know, when would we see uh, uh, full vaccination in Africa? And I think the, uh, the best answer to that is that the actions that are taken now and in the very near future are going to determine that. Um, we, obviously, the critical issue is supply and having adequate supply uh, to serve all people in all countries who need vaccination. Um, there are actions that can be taken now, both by through funding uh, from, from, uh, from countries, through dose sharing, through increasing manufacturing, which we've talked about before, about what the steps are to um, rapidly accelerate manufacturing uh, now and in the medium and longer term. Um, and I think the, the other issue is the importance of uh, equitable distribution of those vaccines. As, as we've said so many times, um, there are a large number of doses uh, that are inequitably distributed, and this is not going to result in um, uh, immunity and vaccination of, of uh, all countries at the same pace to protect those who are most vulnerable. I think we really have to focus on the healthcare workers now in many countries who do not yet have vaccination access, do not yet have adequate supply in countries. And there are many countries that have started vaccination, but not enough doses to actually give the second dose at this point. So we're in a really critical um, phase right now of assuring that those at highest risk, healthcare workers, those who are at highest risk of hospitalization and death um, are prioritized in all countries around the world. And that means moving supply into countries 
um, that uh, have inadequate supply at this point to, to actually deliver that critical public health benefit. Thank you so much. Just to inform you that uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley and uh, Ms. Henrietta Four had to leave for other engagements, but we do have online with us Dr. Robin Nandy, UNICEF Chief of Immunization, and I would like to see if he wanted to chip in to this question. Dr. Nandy. Yeah, hi. No, I, no, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think Kate and Maria answered the question appropriately. And, and, and I, just, I, I, I just want to reiterate the message of Dr. Tedros uh, um, and Vieta for and uh, Seth Berkeley uh, about the importance of uh, uh, delivering COVID-19 vaccine in parallel to ex existing childhood vaccination as well. Um, as more and more COVID-19 vaccines are available, uh, there is uh, uh, a chance of further disruption of routine immunization services. What we don't want to see is uh, concurrent outbreaks of other vaccine preventable diseases as we respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, because that would be a disaster uh, to the health system, to the economy, uh, to families and to communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nandy. Again, this was Dr. Robin Nandy, UNICEF's Chief of Immunization, and I'm looking at Dr. Bruce Aylward, uh, Special Advisor to the Director General and the Lead on Act Accelerator here in the room. Uh, thanks, Christian, and thanks, Simon, for this uh, question. It's so important. We just want to come back and make a few more comments on it. If you think just back three months ago, very few countries, almost none in Africa, had even started vaccinating. And as of today, all but seven countries in the African Union have now actually got vaccines and they've been able to start vaccination. So I think that proves, Simon, where there's a will um, and truly an international will, there is a way to get people vaccinated in the places that have to get vaccinated. And when you ask what we can expect in terms of seeing fully vaccinated uh, populations in Africa, the goal is to ensure at least 30% of the population in Africa is, is vaccinated this year. As you know, the goal of COVAX originally at 20% has been increased now to try and get that vaccination. And as Kate alluded to, that would be sufficient to cover the healthcare workers, most of the, uh, oh, sorry, the older population, and most of the populations at risk of severe disease or death. But the only way we're going to achieve that if there's a fundamental shift in the way that we are distributing those vaccines. And as we've called on earlier today, I mean, we're calling on countries with excess doses to do their part in trying to ensure there are sufficient doses going to Africa to hit those targets through COVAX. But also there's a very, very important role for suppliers to be playing here as well. And we're calling also on the suppliers to ensure that when they have additional capacity as they develop it, they offer it to COVAX before they offer it to high income countries or upper middle income countries or the highest bidders. We're, offering, we're asking also that suppliers make sure that they uh, and make offers to countries with excess doses that they will work with them to ensure those doses can contractually be moved to uh, COVAX. So there are many things that can be done, not just by the countries that hold uh, some of these contracts, but also uh, the suppliers with whom those contracts are held. We need the collaboration of both sides working with us in COVAX and with Gavi and UNICEF, our partners, to make sure that we can have access to that capacity because that's the only way, Simon, that we're going to hit those coverage targets which could fundamentally change the risk uh, of uh, severe disease in Africa in the very short term, actually. Thank you all so much. Next question goes to Arvin Bashinge from Observer Times India. Arvin, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you for considering my question. How is area categorization being done by the governments of countries during the COVID-19 pandemic for providing routine immunization services? Is there essential need to separate infrastructure for immunizing pregnant women and infants network along with the mobile clinic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arvin. I'm not sure we got all your points individually, but uh, 
Maybe Dr. O'Brien can start and we see if we cover most of it. Yeah, well, uh, it was a little bit difficult to hear you, but um, I think your question was primarily around maintaining routine immunization services during the COVID pandemic um, in countries, and especially the attention to um, services for pregnant women and for infants. Um, and I think the important thing to um, remind people of is these are life-saving vaccines, just as COVID vaccine is a life-saving vaccine. The portfolio of vaccines that is provided, there are 12 vaccines that are in the program of every country around the world. Um, and they are um, in every country around the world because these are life-threatening diseases uh, that without vaccines would result in upwards of 4 million deaths every year, year in and year out. And so that's what the programs are doing already. Um, we've, in the course of the COVID pandemic, um, we've reported previously that there was a massive disruption to those immunization services. Over, over two-thirds of countries um, reported very significant disruptions. And now, still, over a third of countries are reporting significant disruptions. And so the importance of countries um, recovering these routine immunization programs and doing so in a way that protects the health workers who are delivering services and protects um, those who are coming for the services uh, so that they can receive life-saving vaccines without feeling like they're being put at risk of a COVID exposure. Um, and these are the kinds of um, investments that countries are making. And it, frankly, it costs more money to deliver services um, because of the personal protective equipment uh, that health workers um, need in order to protect themselves, because of the expansion of clinic hours that is needed to assure that people aren't in crowded circumstances. And we would strongly um, uh, uh, support and encourage countries um, especially to return with every effort the services to their pre-pandemic levels and to go beyond that to assure that children and pregnant women and older adults and adolescents are able to receive those life-saving vaccines um, that are uh, available and needed um, for a healthy future for, for all of those ages. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Brien. The next question goes to Stephanie Nibbehai from Reuters. Stephanie, no, she has dropped off. Then we move to Todd Gillsby from Bloomberg. He, he also dropped. Well, all the questions got answered already. So then let's go for Jeremy Launch, and that might be possibly our last question. Anyway, Jeremy Launch from LFE. Jeremy, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, I didn't drop, so here's my question. Um, uh, I was referring to uh, what you said about the disruption of the immunization campaign. Uh, I was wondering, do you fear that uh, beyond the, the, the disruption and, and that, we, that we see, you fear that the manufacturers might have troubles getting raw materials for non-COVID vaccines? Thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, Dr. O'Brien, please. Yes, yeah, so we've been working with and looking carefully at the um, production of the non-COVID vaccines, um, the vaccines that are uh, throughout the, the regular program, um, and looking very carefully at the um, pace of production. Uh, and there is, of course, play in the system. Um, the vaccines are not produced in a just-in-time sort of fashion, so there is some flexibility within the system. We've seen that flexibility actually diminish over time, so there is uh, less uh, less capacity sitting in um, the supply chain. We have seen some countries that have had disruptions to their supply, but none that have been severe and none that have been prolonged. That being said, virtually all of the manufacturers of uh, routine immunizations and the essential immunization program, the vast majority of them are involved in one way or another with the development and production of COVID vaccines. So especially as there's pressure on uh, the COVID vaccine manufacturing, this is a very important area to assure that we don't end up in a situation where we have supply constraint on uh, the, the, the many other vaccines that are in the program. So we're not in a crisis situation right now. 
um, and we have uh, a limited number of examples where there has been a supply disruption for a short period of time. But this um, has to remain an area where we're uh, very attentive and the manufacturers are very attentive both to, as you say, raw materials um, and the other uh, uh, components that are needed um, beyond the raw materials to actually produce vaccines. And I might ask um, if uh, Robin Nandi from UNICEF, um, who uh, UNICEF also, as, as we've mentioned, is the largest um, procurer of vaccines uh, around the world. Um, and I wonder if Robin has something he would like to add to this. Yeah, again, Kate, you covered uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the response very well. Um, I think the other uh, the piece is, is that, you know, while um, uh, we, we, we saw a drop in supply of vaccines over the last year, um, we've also seen a drop in consumption. And, and, and th th this means that we haven't seen large-scale stockouts. Uh, and, you know, we are uh, working with the uh, manufacturers to, uh, you know, to uh, carefully forecast vaccine needs over the next uh, several months uh, 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 to, to, you know, to make sure that we have adequate attention to both uh, uh, play, uh, routine vaccines as well as um, COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you very much, Dr. Nandi. With this, we come to the end of our briefing. Thank you all for your participation. We will be sending the audio file and Dr. Tedros' remarks right after the press conference, and the full transcript will be posted on the WHO website tomorrow morning. For any other follow-up questions, please send an email to mediainquiries at who.int. Dr. Tedros, please. Yeah, thank you. So I would like to thank uh, Henrietta and Seth for joining and all uh, media colleagues who have joined today. And see you in our upcoming uh, presser. Thank you.